Want to make a podcast? Spotify's got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money, all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer, so no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then, you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available on Spotify. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I feel like I've been having a lot more connection with my listeners through the Q&As and polls. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com forward slash podcasters to get started. Hi everyone, I'm Amber Rose, the Religious Hippie, and welcome to A Catholic's Perspective. For those of you just finding this podcast, let me tell you a little about myself. I was born and raised a cradle Catholic until I fell away from the church for eight years. I just recently came back to the church and I could not be happier with where I am today. I am currently a junior in college and I'm studying graphic design. I am an ambassador for multiple amazing Catholic Christian companies and I love working with all of them. Now, some of you may already know me from my popular religious hippie social media channels, such as TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I have all kinds of Catholic content on there, so don't forget to go check those out. So the reason I wanted to start a podcast was so that I'd be able to have a longer format which people could listen to from wherever they are. I particularly wanted to address issues that young Catholics face today in the secular world, and I want to do that by providing information along with commentary and even a little of my own opinion. I can't lie, from time to time I might be discussing very controversial issues, and some will find my opinions unappealing. But I do this out of my faith and service to God. We must keep communicating with each other, respecting each other, and put each other on the path to sainthood. I think you'll enjoy the podcasts coming up, and I thank you for being here with me. Hey everybody, welcome back to my podcast. Today I have a special guest with me, Sailor Sable. She's a Catholic convert, a friend of mine, and she makes her own rosaries. Welcome, Sailor. Hey, it's so great to be on. Thanks so much for having me. Of course. It's always a pleasure having you here. So I would love for you to give a little background for the listeners today of how old you are, what your upbringing was like, and all that fun stuff. Oh, absolutely. I'm 20 years old. I am a political science pre-law major at the University of Central Florida. And growing up, my parents are both Christians. My mom is actually, she's in RCIA right now, but she was raised Baptist and my dad Lutheran. So, uh, but they never really had a deep spiritual connection and they were always busy people that like sleeping in on the weekends so I grew up nominally Christian where it's like oh yeah I love Jesus Jesus is great but you know not really connected with him not just like praying when I felt like I needed something or when I was stressed or scared not just you know all of the time it was a very shallow surface level relationship with religion in my family and you know my faith journey at all started when I was in uh, fifth and sixth grade. I went to a small Baptist school um, called Barnabas, and I don't think it's still around, so I hope I'm okay saying the name of it, but, you know, every uh, kid, yeah, there was nine kids in my whole grade. It was a really small school, and every single one of those kids hated me, and every time I walked into the classroom, they would all audibly, like, roll their eyes and sigh at me and I would be like really sad about that and I'd start crying and the teacher would be like what are you crying about nobody's ever mistreated you at this school and so it was very hypocritical on the one hand it's like you know they would talk about Jesus and about love and all these nice things and on the other hand they were just not living that and not reflecting the love of Christ back to me so in my mind I thought you know Jesus sounds good. Love Jesus. That's great. But religion is a sham. 
I thought organized religion was just for hypocrites that want to feel like they're holier than you, that want to be able to talk down to you, but not actually live it out. I thought people that went to church were inherently hypocritical. And so I said to myself, uh, you know, I love Jesus and I can pray on my own and I can have a relationship with Jesus on my own, but I don't need to have religion. And I feel like that's an interesting point. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that too, because, you know, we always hear this term relationship over religion from Protestant circles, when in reality, it's relationship through religion. But from the experience that you had, it's, it's one that's very common. I've heard of very often. And I'm like, well, obviously as Christians, we're called to live out the gospel. We're called to have uh, Christ in us and show through us. But so many times we lack in that. And especially in um, schools and things of that nature, I see that a lot. So I, I, I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was at the point where I was like, I'll, I can do it on my own. And I was like, you know, I don't need anybody to tell me what I believe. I'm smart enough to figure out what I feel is true and follow my instincts and what I think I believe. And, you know, I don't need anyone telling me what to believe about Jesus or about the Bible. And so that's how I was operating. You know, I, before I started college, I'd been to church maybe like five times at most in my life. And so I, you know, even when I was going to that school, I wasn't going to church, but I was just learning through the classes. And, you know, I, I said, I'll just have a relationship with Jesus without going to church, but that didn't happen because I continued in the habit of just believing what I wanted to believe praying when I needed something, not actually cultivating and developing that relationship. And it got to uh, like a, a high point, like, um, um, what do you call it? A peak? Yeah, it's ascension. It yeah. Yeah. It peaked at, um, so at this point in my life, this was my freshman year of college. This was uh, 2021. It was uh, February CPAC was coming up, which for people that don't know, it's the, um, it's a political conference uh, for conservatives. It's in, it's very important. Donald Trump was speaking there. You know, everybody was going there. It was the main thing. And my entire life revolved around two things. It revolved around politics and it revolved around singing. I placed like all of my entertainment, all of everything I cared about was in politics. And then my self-worth and how I judged myself and how I felt about myself all revolved around my singing and how good of a singer I was. And it, I, I sang like you breathe, like the second I get home from school, I was singing, you know, if I was alone, I was singing, you know, second I was in the car after a vacation, I was singing. So that was everything to me. And so when I got the chance to sing at CPAC, this huge convention, I got the chance to sing the national anthem. That was the biggest dream come true for me. This was it. This was, I'm going to make it. You know, I, at the time I was majoring in biology, I was going to be a doctor. I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't have any calling to it, but I thought, you know, I have to do this to make money and make my family proud. So I thought that's what I had to do. And I was like, this is my big break. You know, everything can change from here. This could be an interest in the politics or performing or music. This could go wonderfully. And right before performing, I got so sick. I lost my voice. Like I could not sing certain ways. It's I like had the worst to, like, thing to happen. <laughs> yeah. I had to completely relearn how to do the song without my voice cracking. And it turns out I could not hit the right notes. And I knew that. So I was trying to change the notes to fit my voice instead of my voice changing to hit the notes because I physically couldn't. And I was just praying. I was for the first time in a long time since I could remember, I was praying and I was begging God, don't let me screw this up. Don't let me fail. Don't let me, don't let this be a disaster. Please just let this pull through for me. This is my dream. This is my one chance. Just let this go well. And I go out there and I bomb it. It's horrific. And I will not deny that I did horribly. And, you know, it spiraled into like, even my friend group at college Republicans were making fun of me for it. I lost all of my friends that I thought I had. I lost my dream of singing because, you know, everybody all over the world was telling me what a horrible singer I was. Professional musicians were making videos critiquing me and showing me just how badly I sucked, you know, three months wow. straight. 
yeah, for three months, my inbox was people telling me to kill myself and to never sing again. And that I'm a disappointment to my, to the whole, like even Republicans were saying, you're a disappointment to our party. You've completely humiliated us. You are that bad a singer. And wow. it, it was really bad. It was horrible. People were trying to dox my mom where she <laughs> works. People were like threatening to kill me. You know, people were trying to find all out. Because, you know, all because you were sick during a, a thing and you couldn't hit the notes like that's all you know how crazy it is when people ramp something up so much to the point where it's like it really shouldn't have been that big of a deal right like it was a big deal in the sense of like it was a big event right but the moment happened it is what it is let's move on but instead we see this like latching on to negativity and and things from people it's crazy yeah and it's like the second you do something embarrassing online, you lose your humanity to a lot of people because uh, if you have the potential to be entertainment at your own expense, you're only valued for your ability to be entertaining to other people and you're not valued for being a person. So if people get entertainment by humiliating you and making fun of you and degrading you, then that is your value that you're offering to people, not your value as a human. So none of your feelings matter anymore. What matters is what can you supply? What can I do to use you in order to gain uh, entertainment or excitement out of you? So it's, it's a very like material way of looking at people. It's a very utilitarian way of viewing people online, but sadly that's, that's something we all can fall into. Like when someone becomes a meme, you know, people will say whatever they want and they don't think about how it's going to make the person feel. Some people think about it and go out of their way to directly tell me, Hey, you suck. I still get people every now and then that DM me like your, your singing's terrible. And I'm like, wow, never <laughs> knew that. That's the first I've heard of it. Thank you. <laughs> but it was pretty bad. And I, I lost my dream. I lost my reason for waking up and for being happy. I lost the thing that mattered to me most. I lost what I defined myself by. And I was really depressed. I only had one friend left at this point. And um, he and I aren't that close anymore. But at the time, he was my only friend. And I said, you know, I can't go on like this forever. It, it took me a couple months of trying to deal with it by myself, deal with it through therapy, just get over it. And I just couldn't get over it. And I was like, there's something missing in my life and I need to get right with God. Um, and he offered to take me to mass. And I thought, well, that can't be too different than these Protestant services. I want to, I'll just sit there and listen to whatever the dude has to say. And then, you know, I'll go home and, you know, it'll be a nice thing to do. All right. I did not expect mass to be very different, but it was extremely different in the best ways, but very different. I always tell people that going to mass the first time without any context is like being invited to a flash dance and you're the only one that doesn't know the choreography. <laughs> it's accurate. Yeah, everybody's doing all these things and repeating after him and like saying these things back and I have no idea what's happening. I'm just watching my friend like, what language is this? <laughs> what do you speak? Like it was in English, but I still didn't understand. You know, it was, it was really challenging for me, but it was also intriguing and interesting. And, you know, it inspired me to look up and understand mass. It led me to like listening to Ascension Presents and the Bible in a year. And I learned what the Eucharist is. And I never really knew what the Eucharist was before that. And when I first heard about it, I thought, well, that's ridiculous. But listening to Jesus's words about it and learning the history of the church and the authority of the church. And after months of looking into it, it took a lot of um, humility. It took me removing myself and saying, you know, you think you know what's right and what's wrong and what's true and what's false based on your own instincts, but you haven't even read the Bible. And there's a church, there's an institution founded by Jesus that its entire existence for 2000 years has been nothing but dissecting script, scripture, uh, dissecting the Bible, dissecting history and coming to conclusions. And what makes you think that you're smarter than an institution that's entire purpose is dedicated to finding these answers? Why do you think you're better than them why do you think you know more when you haven't done any research barely? You don't even think about it. You don't even pray unless you need something. So who are you to say what's right?
instead of them. Mm -hmm. And so once I got to that point and I relinquished my need for control, I was able to appreciate what Catholicism taught. And when I understood the logical arguments for the Eucharist and how it does make sense for that to be literal and that that's not a metaphor. And when I understood the importance of Mary and I understood the tradition and the importance of tradition and how it's not arbitrary and it's not just made up and how the church has authority. Once my mind was open to accepting those facts, my heart was open too. And when I would go to mass, it was the first time in months I could sing without crying because I, at the point I couldn't even listen to music. It was too painful, but it wasn't, I wasn't singing for myself anymore. There's was a difference. Singing. Yeah. There's a big difference. And so it didn't hurt anymore. And I, it felt right. Right. Everything just felt right. I mean, I had to logically open myself up to the arguments, but then I also had to just listen to what my heart was saying. You know, I was list I, I relied on my heart to come up with all these arguments and opinions, but I wasn't listening to my heart to see what feels right genuinely. And what felt right was Catholicism. It felt true. It didn't just sound true. It felt real. And being in front of the Eucharist in adoration and praying the rosary and the like impact that had on my life. Even my mom who did not have any good things to say about Catholicism, didn't have any connection to it, was raised Baptist. She was looking at my life. And when I was stressed, she was like, well, have you prayed your rosary today? That makes you feel better. You know, she could see the change that that had in my life. And my entire life is different now. That's I've amazing. never been happier. I am so happy now. I was baptized this Easter. You know, I got my first communion confirmation, all that jazz. And I have just been riding that wave. I feel like a whole new set of graces has come to my life because baptism isn't just a symbol. And you don't know that until you're baptized, truly. Like you can know the arguments for it, but experiencing baptism and the feeling you get in your heart when that happens and just the change in your life and the amount of grace you have. If you were baptized as a baby, you don't know what it's like to live without baptism, but there is a big difference. That's amazing. So I know you said that, you know, you, um, you struggle a lot with like depression and everything like that. Was there um, a specific time in your life where you felt like you hit rock bottom and felt like you had to lean on Jesus or was it more like, um, you know, was rock bottom when your friend took you to church with him to mass. Yeah, that was rock. Cause I, I had struggled with depression and anxiety all of my life. My anxiety was so bad in high school. You know, another thing I really placed importance on for a, defining myself was my grades. And every time I took a test in school, I would be sobbing the whole time. I was so nervous. And then the teacher would come in and say, oh, Sailor, you got a 100. You got the best score in the class. See, you were crying for nothing. And then everybody would look at me like, oh, she's crazy. But, you know, <laughs> I that's the level of anxiety and stress I had. And I was very much a loner and I was very lonely. So I struggled with that for a long time, not fitting in with people, but it really was CPAC and losing all of my friends in college Republicans at the same time CPAC happened, that just broke me. And so it was in that brokenness, sitting at rock bottom, not moving upward for months that I was finally going to mass. Wow, that's amazing. I mean, I know it's it's interesting how we hit our lowest points and that sometimes when God reveals himself to us the most. Um, and now you're making your own rosaries and doing that. How did you get into that? And also for our viewers, stay until the end of this podcast because we have a special announcement. But Sailor, what caused you to start making the rosaries and want to make a business out of this? Well, it's funny because it all kind of happened on accident. Um, you know, I didn't own any rosaries when I first started converting. So I'd say back in September is when I first started taking it seriously and I, you know, I sculpted my own crucifix and I sculpted my own uh, statue of Mary holding a baby Jesus. And then, you know, I was like, okay, I have these two Catholic things. So if I'm going to be taking this seriously, I should have Catholic things and Catholics 
like rosaries. So I'm going to make one because I was like, um, I'm not fully into it yet. So I'm not going to go ahead and buy something. I'm not going to spend any money on anything, but I'll make stuff because making stuff's fun. And so, you know, I got my clay because uh, for a long time I was a sculptor and that was my main art form. And I, you know, made each bead by hand. I made the cross by hand and I That's baked amazing. it. I baked it in the oven, thank you. And I put it together and I was like, huh, that's really fun. And I really enjoyed that. So then after I made my first rosary, I was like, I'll give praying this a try. And um, just, I pray a rosary every day now. I have periods of times where I fall off of it and then I feel bad because I'm like, my life's falling apart. I need my rosary. And then I get back into praying it every day. And my life is a lot better when I pray it. But just the overwhelming sense of peace that granted me to pray one and the joy of that was astonishing and I just thought well this is something very important and I like making it so I'm going to just make more so I went ahead and I bought some real beads like really cheap tiny seed beads and I would just make dozens of them and you know I'd sell them for like five dollars to the uh, old lazy old ladies in the choir at church and you know it was just a very small thing you know I mostly did it for myself I never thought I was going to make a, a job out of it and eventually I was like you know it'd be fun if I got some nice beads and started to make these so I got some nicer ones and I made some nice rosaries and I had a few dozen of those and then I went to this uh conference called Ascend that's for like uh college kids that are Catholic to go to and like socialize and listen to speakers and I was like, you know what, just for, just for fun, I'll bring my bag of rosaries. And you know, if I sell some, that'll be fun. And over three days, I made $2,000. That's amazing. I, I sold all my rosaries and I never expected it to go that well, but everyone's like, these are so unique. I've never seen a rosary like this before. I really love this, you know? So I felt like I was on cloud nine. I was like, wow, you know, someone really appreciates my art that I've made and I really enjoy making this. So maybe I should take it a little more seriously because there's actual profit potential here. So I set up my Etsy. I got my, my like picture taking equipment to take nice photos of them. I, you know, turned the spare bedroom into a studio. I got way too many beads and a lot of supplies and I just got to work and I could make like, six to 12 a day I would do nothing but make them I would be on work calls making them in the background you know wow, would, that's awesome and it was just so much fun so you know I'm so blessed to have been given something I'm good at that I love doing that I've actually see a lot of potential for being successful so that's just the biggest blessing I could have asked for and it's such a great hobby it's interesting when, you know, we're finally in the place where God wants us to be, how the doors just kind of fling open. You know, it's funny how he communicates that. Um, I know you said that obviously you, the rosary helps with your anxiety and everything like that. What other changes in your life have you seen since praying the rosary? Well, I think a lot of it does link back to the anxiety, but it's, it's, it's full fledged because it replaced anxiety with with true joy and you know it's joy I never knew what it was because I didn't have it and you only understand what true joy is when you live it because I thought it was the same as happiness but happiness is fleeting it's an emotion it's just a feeling but joy is this true peace this sense of meaning of belonging of knowing you're on the right track and even when things are rough being okay with yourself and being okay with whatever happens because you know it's a part of God's will. And, you know, every time I struggle with anything, I'm back at the rosaries. You know, for a while, I was really enjoying Catholicism and learning about it and like devoting myself to it. And so I thought, you know, maybe I'm supposed to be a nun. The problem is, I did not want to be a nun because I love babies. And I really want babies. So me too. <laughs> yes. So I was praying and I was like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. I know what I want to do, but I, again, I have to humble myself to say your will, not mine. Show me, you know, what it is I'm supposed to do. And, you know, that day I'm praying a rosary, it's nighttime. And, you know, the second I pick my rosary up, I have like this phantom limb feeling where it's like, I feel myself holding a baby. 
I feel that weight in my arms, even though my arms aren't even in that position, I'm just holding my rosary, but it feels like I'm holding a baby. And as I start praying, once I get halfway through the rosary, like exactly halfway through, you know, I open my eyes and I see a vision of Mary walk to the side of my bed and sit down and she smiles at me and I look and she's holding a baby. And the whole time I'm praying the rosary, I feel this very real feeling like I'm holding a baby. And, you know, ever since then, I've known that my will does align with God. And because I was able to remove myself from the equation and with an open heart, ask God what he wanted from my life, despite knowing what I wanted, but opening myself up to whatever he would say, he granted me the peace of knowing that I can have what I want. And he showed me that my will is in line with his. And it's the greatest comfort I could have ever received. That's amazing. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's such a cool story with Our Lady and everything. I don't feel like enough people share their experiences with that. So that's really amazing. I know, um, especially when praying the rosary, like there's such a there's a communication happening, you know, like our ladies, you know, whatever we need, our lady is there trying to communicate on our behalf to God. And um, that's amazing that you got that clarification. And so do you think that like marriage is your vocation? I definitely think marriage is my vocation, you know, and I had some doubts about that because some people were like, well, what if that means you're supposed to run an orphanage? And I'm like, well, maybe I am supposed to be a nun. So I was very confused. And then, you know, there was another time I was at um, adoration. I was praying to God and I was like, I'm going to ask you again. You know, I, I thought it was pretty clear, but maybe it's not, you know, I'm humbling myself to you again. Tell me what you want me to do. And I got this sense, go open your Bible. And so I grabbed my Bible and I prayed and I said, God, please, you've given me signs before. I know you could again, if it's in your will, this would be very helpful for me if you could clear some things up. So, you know, if you want me to be married, please let me open up to a verse about marriage. If you want me to be a nun, please help me open up to a verse about chastity or abstinence or something like that, or religious life or vocation. And so I prayed that and very scared. I opened my Bible. I placed my finger down on a random page. Okay. So it says, um, no, my Lord, I'm a woman deeply troubled, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been seeking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she And she said, let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. And the Lord remembered her. And as soon as I read that, I was bawling because it was so specific to what I was doing. I was crying in there already a little bit. I was really anxious. I was pouring my heart out to God because I wanted to do what was right by him. And I wanted to do what he wanted for me to do in my life. But I wanted so bad to have kids and to get married because I have a boyfriend who I've been with almost six months now, and I love him to pieces. And, you know, I didn't want to have to say, oh, I'm breaking up with you to be a nun. But I knew that if that's what God wanted me to do, then there's no other option. So I was very vexed and I was pouring my heart out to God. And it couldn't have been more specifically tailored to me if he spoke right in my ear, because it's just, he did speak to me. And this is something I do often, but this is the most clear example of God speaking to me I've had through this experience, because, you know, I often, people often say, you know, I pray and God doesn't answer me. And I say, you know, God's already talked to us. He said what he needs to say, and it's in the Bible. And, and if you need to know what God's saying to you, read your Bible. And all the time, I just open it up and I find what key words are speaking out to me. And it might seem a little cheesy, but it works for me more times than not. Every time I open my Bible to a random page, I find something 
really relevant to what I'm going through. And you know, the craziest thing is like half the time I just open my Bible randomly and I'm like, why am I seeing verses like this? This has nothing to do with what I'm going through. And then like the next day I'll have a new problem. I'm like, oh, that's what it was warning me about. I never saw it coming. But and it's, it's interesting because we do call it God's word. Like it's how he speaks to us, you know, obviously we have to think about things relevant in the time when the Bible was, you know, being written and then compiled by the church. But in reality, like it, all of it still applies to today, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And, you know, there are, there are going to be times where you, it's always good to know the context of the Bible and the section you're looking at. But there are times where I open things up and it doesn't apply to like, like if I read it literally based on the like context of the scripture verse, it doesn't make sense. But when I read the verse out of context, it can fit a lot to what I'm doing. Because that same day I asked God, you know, okay, so you don't want me to be a nun. What now? I open the Bible. I put my finger down and I get to the verse that says, surely you already know. And I'm like, well, surely I don't because I'm asking God. So I figured, well, maybe that means I'm supposed to keep doing what I'm doing and go to law school. Cause you know, after CPAC, I changed my major, you know, cause I figured, you know, if I could handle CPAC, I could handle being a lawyer. I could handle Amazing. being a politician because, you know, I've already had to stand up to myself against all of Twitter. So <laughs> I could stand up for myself, you know, in a debate. That's Twitter what is I a hellhole. I cannot explain to you the amount of rancidness that happens on Twitter. It's vile. Like, it's you know, the TikTok of videos or TikTok of words, I guess I should say. That is a good way of looking at it. That is so <laughs> true. But uh, so that day I uh, open up the Bible again because I'm like, okay, so God says, surely you already know. I open it again and I get to the verse. She is the book of my commandments, the law that endures forever. And I think the context of that is wisdom is the book of his commandments, the law that endures forever. But in the context of surely you already know, and me asking God what he wants me to do with his life, I took that as he wants me to go into law. He wants me to be the book of his commandments, the law that endures forever. He wants me to fight for what's moral and just in society and to try to make this a nation that doesn't spite God. So that's amazing. Yeah. Especially so, with all the corruption we see today. Yeah, so I, I knew that that's saying to me, God wants me to go into this field and be a positive change for it. You know, a big part of me was hoping I would open up to something like Proverbs 31 and it'd be like, oh, just be a stay-at-home wife. And I could be like, oh, that's easy. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just be with my kids and have no drama, you know, not in the political sphere. But right. no, God... God's telling me what he wants me to do and that's a more difficult path but you know I'm sure it'll be rewarding when I oh, get absolutely. to implement it absolutely yeah. and I think that's amazing and um, especially how scripture can speak to us because I have two bibles I have the great adventure bible and then I have a regular English standard version that I yeah. use note takes in um, do yep. you pray the rosary, rosary scripturally usually, do you think, or is it more like in your head and you like to meditate? Cause I mean, obviously it's a meditation, but do you usually have your Bible when you're praying or is it just whenever you need it? Um, almost every time I do the rosary, unless I don't have internet connection, I'm listening with hallow. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes I'll do the English version. Sometimes I'll do the Latin version. Sometimes I'll do the special one they call like a scriptural rosary where in between each Hail Mary, they have a Bible verse that's from the mystery. And so, you know, it helps you further meditate on the mystery because, you know, it has the Bible verses in between explaining the story as it progresses. So that's helpful for me. And, you know, it really depends on what I need. Sometimes the rosary is a conversation with God where I'm not really focusing on the mysteries. I'm focusing on my petitions and I'm thinking things through and I'm pouring out my prayers. And the beautiful thing about a rosary is that, you know, the like prots will be like, oh, vain repetition. And it's like, not if you're doing it right, because if you're praying the rosary and the entire time you're thinking about your grocery list or your chores or, oh, I, when I get home, I have to feed my dog and then I have to do my homework. Then you're praying the rosary wrong. And that's vain repetition. Don't do that. That's bad. But if when you're praying the rosary, you're contemplating and you're thinking it is the most useful tool for prayer because it forces you to sit with God for at least like 20 minutes. You have to sit there with God and you have to spend that time praying. Cause when I first started praying, 
I didn't know how to fill the space. I didn't know what to say. I didn't give myself space to listen. I didn't know what I was doing. But when I started praying the rosary, it forced me to think about things. It's like, okay, I have 20 minutes with God. I'm not going anywhere. I can't end this. I can't cut this short. Now what? And so it forces you to give yourself the space to be open to receiving what God's trying to tell you. I love that. And there's, you know, prayer beads. I mean, whether it's that or a chaplet or the Jesus prayer, you know, it forces you to have a set amount of time to sit with God, you know, and the perfect thing is that when I lose my words and I don't know what I want to talk about God with, I can just refocus on the words of the rosary. I can just focus back in on what it's saying and reflect on Mary and reflect on Jesus and his life, you know, and it's, it puts things in perspective. And again, it humbles you down to say, this is God brought to earth, sacrificed for me and his mother, queen of the universe here for me, praying for me and will be praying for me till the hour of my death. So it, it's just a whole new light of love and the capacity for love God has for you. That even when you lose the words to say, when you just focus in on what the rosary is saying, even when you don't have your own words, it's a beautiful prayer. And it, you can't pray the rosary and sin at the same time because you're going to give up one or the other. Either you're going to, you know, stop sinning because the rosary convicts you, or you're going to feel bad about that conviction and give up praying the rosary. But, right. you know, if you're dedicated to the rosary, your life is going to be cleansed because you cannot live with yourself. If you're in a state of sin, you cannot live with yourself and say such a beautiful prayer and be okay with yourself after that. You are called to change. Right. You want to be worthy to say such a prayer as this. I love that so much. Yes. And thank you so much for sharing with us. It's so beautiful. Uh, your story and also how you started, you know, coming back or not coming back, but coming into the faith. And you were just, uh, you just received into the church on Easter this year. Um, that's so amazing. So welcome home again. And Thank you. Um, so some special news for the listeners that have waited patiently. So Sailor and I are working on a limited edition special religious hippie rosary that's going to be exclusive. It's only going to be around for a limited time. We're getting about 25 of them and they're going to go up on my website in August. So stay tuned. Let me know if you'd be interested in that. Shoot me an email. Let me know. And I am so excited to do this collab with Sailor. Oh, me too. You know, she, she and I designed it together. We, you know, picked out the colors and everything. And I got to tell you, this is one of my favorite rosaries I've ever designed. I already made like a rough sketch of it, you know, just to make sure it had all the right pieces. And it's just, it's so thematically cohesive and it works so well together and it's different than any other rosary I've made. And I kind of specialize in different rosaries. <laughs> if you check out my page, you'll see, uh, by the way, that's uh, rosaries underscore by underscore sailor on Instagram and just rosaries by sailor normal on Etsy. The Etsy link is in my Instagram bio because sometimes if you just Google search it for an Etsy store, it's hard to find. So okay. make sure you go to my Instagram and then click the link to my Etsy if you want to see everything I have available. And my Instagram has a whole record of almost every rosary I've ever made. I love that so much. Well, thank you so much, Sailor, for being here. And I'm sure we will see, be seeing much more of you since, you know, we're collabing together. So Absolutely. thank you again. And um, good luck with everything that's going on in your life right now. I hope it's going really well. Thanks so much, Amber. Have a great day. God bless. You too. God bless. And with all of that being said, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast episode. Again, stay tuned in August for those limited edition rosaries coming out on my uh, website. And I will talk to you guys in the next podcast. Bye. Do you have questions or comments about today's episode? Email me at thereligioushippie at gmail.com or leave a voice message at anchor.fm forward slash thereligioushippie. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please be sure to rate and review this episode. 
This podcast is produced by Todd Fisher and distributed by Metacortex Publishing. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Information and opinions stated in this podcast should not be construed as medical advice. Please be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content.